I've been tasked to talk about the Hadean in the uh, PCE um, lecture series. This talk will be about putting the Hadean in context. I'm going to be trying to keep an eye on clocks throughout this because they don't seem to, there's no clock to be seen in one of these uh, Zoom meetings, except the clock you're looking at right now, which is the great clock of Earth history. This is taking all of Earth and thinking of it as a single clock, one of my favorite analogies um, of geologic history. Usually you see it with a little sliver um, referring to the length of time since last Thursday. This here, what you are here, and it dwarves you compared to the vast bulk of Earth history. So that's what I've done here is I put the Hidean context. Uh, Hidean by definition is the time uh, before 4.0 billion years ago. And, uh, and it starts with the moon forming impact because the planets that pre-exist the moon forming impact are not um, reasonably, are not important to us because we could not, no life could have survived such an event. Uh, a few general trends of Earth history as shown on this clock. Uh, the Hidean's not very long. CO2 is marked by uh, how much um, shading you see here. So it's roughly indicator. Same with impacts. There's a lot of impacts early on, particularly when the Earth is forming and during the Hidean, but they continue through the Archean. The Archean is a time after the Hidean where there is a, there's no question that it's, uh, there is life. The Hidean and Archean was split by Preston Cloud from what had been known as the Azoic Eon, but Azoic became a defunct term when it became apparent that it was Azoic was not Azoic. There was life there. My um, my my computer keeps dinging at me here, so it's being kind of annoying. Uh, do you have an anaerobic period or anaerobic period with some oxygen, a lot of an ozone UV shield called the Proterozoic, currently the Phanerozoic. The future allows for some, well, activity. Um, MIFS is an indicator of oxygen in the atmosphere and it ends at the end of the Archean. And then there are some terminal ice ages at the beginning of the Proterozoic. The Coyote Instant was discussed last week by Fisher, but not in those words. The um, rock record was discussed last week by Rick Carlson. The rock record pertinent to the Hidean. There isn't very much, but he's been to them. Uh, the future has not yet been televised. A general trend to keep an eye on here throughout the clock is that hydrogen escapes. And so there is a tendency towards oxygenation over time. And this is a general rule of Earth history that the Earth has become more oxygenated with time and life becomes more dependent on oxygen, becomes more faster, better, sometimes smarter with the use of oxygen. Uh, midnight will be at, in this clock, will be at six billion years. Uh, at which time the sun will have become too bright for um, liquid water oceans on Earth or engineers have not bothered keeping up or the inhabitants have left. A place to start the, so we start the Hidean with the moon forming impact. Uh, this was discussed last week and it's a good place to start. Uh, after the moon forming impact, you have a melted planet mostly. Um, you will have a silicate vapor atmosphere that will radiate at a very high temperature to space and the silicate clouds and iron clouds, mostly silicate clouds. The, the, in this depiction, which is of a high energy impact, the mantle is thoroughly melted and vigorously stirring. Um, there is evidence that the mantle after the moon forming impact was not, stop dinging boss. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the mantle will need to continue to, um, oh, that was distracting. Uh, the mantle, there is evidence that the mantle was not uh, fully uh, melted 
or fully mixed after the moon forming impact, it's preserved in ruthenium isotopes, which are odd in the oldest cratons. And it's, it's also preserved in some xenon isotopes. And you can, where there's radiogenic um, xenon with a parent of, of 80 million years. So you can see, you see this preservation of heterogeneities that probably predate the moon forming impact. So they may not have, the moon forming impact may not have thoroughly melted the mantle or thoroughly mixed it. Um, thermal evolution after a moon forming impact involves a couple of magma oceans of different kinds. Um, on this plot, we have temperature on the left axis, heat flow on the right. Uh, the effective temperature, which is the radiating temperature of the planet, is determined by the atmosphere and is much lower than the surface temperature, which is here. The striking phase transition you see in this plot is, occurs when heat flow is no longer able to support a runaway greenhouse atmosphere. A runaway green greenhouse atmosphere is full of steam and it condenses when the heat flow from the earth is no longer able to support it. The sunlight helps, but you need 300 watts per meter squared to maintain a um, runaway greenhouse atmosphere and the heat flow is not able to do that indefinitely because there's only so much energy deposited in the impact. Uh, the chain, the phase change here where the temperature, surface temperature drops drastically is when the mantle becomes sufficiently um, solidified that the crystals form an interconnected mesh and the liquid percolates through the crystals. So hotter temperatures to the left here uh, the mantle will be a suspension of crystals in a liquid. And to the right, it's a um, liquid percolating through a matrix of, of solids. And so the, the transition between yellow and purple here is the transition between a mantle that behaves like a liquid and a mantle that behaves rheologically like a solid and convects more sluggishly. Because it's conducting more sluggishly, the heat flow cannot keep up and drop dwindles to modern levels fairly quickly. Uh, this magma ocean is the one people often talk about with the moon the last 100 million years. This magma ocean is the one with a liquid surface and only lasts a couple million years. Uh, the atmosphere after the moon forming impact is dominated by gases expelled from the mantle. CO2 is not very soluble. And so it is mostly partitioned into the atmosphere. Um, Steam, however, is water. Water is more soluble in magmas. And so it is expelled from the mantle as the mantle becomes more and more solidified. And so it builds up over this time. The, the atmosphere forms a strong greenhouse effect and provides a runaway greenhouse atmosphere up till about 2 million years in this example. And then at this point, as mentioned, the mantle starts to solidify the heat flow fails to keep up the keep up with the runaway greenhouse threshold, the water then condenses and rains out and forms oceans. An interesting thing happens, which is that the atmosphere turns to methane as it cools. Well that's a cool thing. You know it's not all methane, but you get a lot of it. And that's a very interesting uh, consequence of the long time scales of coolings. This is just gas phase reactions that made the methane out of the hydrogen and the carbon monoxide and the CO2. The organic hazes will then last for a while until they precipitate, until the methane is exhausted by photochemistry. In this example, the, um, the hydrogen is made from the methane here and then it escapes to space. Carbon monoxide has a peak as well and then disappears in this example. Different examples will have different outcomes. This one has a lot of CO2 in it. And uh, eventually the CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. By presumption here, we were imagining the CO2 will form carbonate rocks. The carbonate rocks will be subducted because the sun is faint. The st static, the stable state of earth would then be ice ages. It would be cold. The general thinking is that reactions of CO2 with silicates are sped by impact ejecta, which are highly damaged and reaction should be quicker and easier. And so the CO2 is more quickly removed from the atmosphere. Once you get into an impact ice age, you have a different kind of climate. Uh, let's talk about redox. 
Redox is oxidation and antioxidation in the world of a geochemist. Biochemists will track electrons for redox. And that's probably the correct thing to do, but I don't understand that and I can't explain it. Geochemists track oxygen and I can count that. That's not that hard. An example, uh, redox is best appreciated by example and you learn it by osmosis. Um, the example here is metallic iron reacting with um, oxygen to make FeO. This is the reaction that occurs, say, when an iron meteorite hits the atmosphere and you make this mineral wustite. Uh, the electrons are reassigned to oxygen from the iron. Two of them moved over here because that's how we're doing the counting. It's just an accounting thing. Oxygen is very electronegative and it is almost always thought to be um, the place where electrons go. And each oxygen gets two of them. In redox, we count the electrons assigned to the oxygen. So the example here is iron. Metallic iron has a redox state of zero. Uh, wistite, the iron oxide, has a redox state of two. Magnetite is plus eight thirds. One of them, one of the irons is plus two, the other two are plus three, no quarks here. And in hematite, um, plus three, iron is as fully oxidized as it's going to get. The, uh, it is usual to define the element as redox zero. Now this is because an element in the crucible is irreducible. Um, when alchemy was evolving into chemistry, one would, um, reduce compounds until it was, you couldn't go any further. And then it became, that was the element. You discovered it and you named it after a town in Sweden. But it's more convenient geochemically to treat water as an element. So we're gonna follow Aristotle and to treat hydrogen as antioxidant. So hydrogen here is gonna be minus one per H. So the H2 has the hydrogen atoms at minus one and water is set to zero. And then we keep score by counting oxygens. The advantage of this is that if we used H2, at zero, which is the chemistry, what would be done in chemistry, methane would also be zero. Carbon is zero, hydrogen is zero, so therefore methane is zero. This is chemically correct because the CH bond is very nearly perfectly covalent, but it's not useful for us. So we're gonna keep score by counting oxygens by treating hydrogen as an antioxidant. Methane equals CO2 plus two waters minus two molecules of oxygen with the so its redox score is minus four. So here's our carbon scoreboard. Read, methane is at minus four. Graphite and diamond are at zero. Carbon monoxide is at plus two. And CO2 is at plus four. Biology is in the range of minus two to zero with most of it over towards zero. Um, carbohydrates are exactly zero. And DNA and proteins are in the range of minus a half or minus a quarter but fats can approach minus two. So here's a big redox picture. We've talked about redox. What, redox is important for the surface. Surfaces in the cosmos are pretty much the only places in the universe where you find oxidized conditions on planetary surfaces. Now there are two absolute uh, things to consider here and two, two absolute processes and several relative processes. Absolute, hydrogen escapes to space. That absolutely oxidizes the planet. And it starts with the atmosphere and it works its way down. In the mantle, iron oxides are seen to disproportionate under high pressure in planets as large as the earth to make iron oxide, which is, to make hematite, which is plus three, or any ferric iron, which is plus three, and metallic iron. This combination is denser, so it's favored by the high pressure. The metallic iron goes to the core. And that would be irreversible, except when the core is disrupted and destroyed. When a planet is destroyed, say in a Star Wars movie, the iron will go into the core and stay there if it's not, the planet is not destroyed. So that leaves the mantle oxidized. And it's an absolute sense, provisional, but absolute. Otherwise, what, whether things hap what happens to the surface depends on what the state of the surface is. Impacts are generally reducing. They tend to have metallic iron and such, but uh, some impacts can be, like a comet could be relatively oxidized. Depending on what the surface is, it can be oxidizing or reducing. Generally though, the impacts will tend to be reducing because they contain the iron that went to the core. Volcanic gases will tend to be um, relatively oxidized compared to uh, what we're interested in. 
they tend to have water CO2 and SO2 because the mantle was relatively oxidized by the disproportionation and the removal of iron. Uh, but uh, they could, they are on net reduced compared to the current situation, which is an oxygen surface. Continents tend to be oxidized. They have more oxidized um, materials in them than they have reduced materials in them. C here would be shale, while this would be uh, oxidized gabbros and such. Subduction is of uncertain sign, depending on what gets subducted. Uh, you can subduct uh, oxidized materials, like a, like a bionded iron formation or a sulfate or a carbonate, or you could subduct reducing materials and uh, pyrite, say, or organic carbon. And the net effect on the surface depends on what the surface state is and whether these are more what you are resubducting. Redox and life. Modern theories of the material origin of life. Uh, material origin of life was thought necessary uh, because uh, when Pasteur proved that life begets life, you, you had a choice of a divine origin of life and, a, and separate from other evolution or a material origin of life in which the origin of life was not divine. Uh, so if you were a communist, for example, like Haldane or Operin or Bernal, you, you would, you would uh, search for a material origin of life, do, doing it through ordinary um, science, ordinary chemistry. Um, the material, people studying the material origin of life have universally agreed that the earliest atmosphere of Earth was highly reduced, the so-called Miller-Urey atmosphere with lots of hydrogen, methane, and either ammonia or hydrogen cyanide. This is needed because the ingredients needed to make uh, DNA or RNA require nitriles. Fixed nitrogen require reduced substances. Ammonia and, hydro and hydrogen cyanide are very good beginnings for making nitriles. Methane provides the conditions that allow ammonia and cyanide to produce nitriles. Geologists have for nearly as long uh, argued that any atmosphere exhaled from Earth's mantle would be weakly reducing at best with a strong preference for water, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. This is inconsistent with origin of life on Earth. Yuri sided with Operin, and he argued that any story of Earth's formation of the solar system must account for the origin of life as a boundary condition, as a constraint on the model for how you make the Earth. Well, meanwhile, geologists have dug in. The current idea is that as I mentioned, is the iron oxide disproportionation leaves the mantle somewhat oxidized. And from the start, once the planet is large enough to have this process occur, Mars is not large enough, but an Earth-sized planet is. And so their mantles are going to be oxidized. You have a paradox. We do have a paradox. At this point, Steve Benner likes to quote Niels Bohr. Now we have some hope of making progress. Why is a paradox good? Because it focuses on something you don't know. It says, you don't know this. So it helps to have a paradox to focus your attention. And the resolution of the paradox is to use the impacts. We're gonna use the impacts to reduce things because they act preferentially on the surface. So they will work for us. Impact de degassing was the first attempt at this. It uses the reducing power of impacting bodies to reduce the atmospheres in the same impacting body. So you take a, bod take a body, you drop it on the earth at the very high speed that they hit the earth. You create a cloud of elements that recombine into gases. Those gases are equilibrated with the material of the impactor itself. And they tend to be reduced because the impactor itself was reduced. It was impact degassing was addressed by Schaefer and Fegley in a series of studies beginning in 2007 and also independently proposed and explored by Hashimoto. Abe and Sujita also in 2007. But here I'll scribble over a screenshot from Schaefer and Fegley of 2017. What they've computed here are gas contents as a function of temperature. Temperature is the x-axis here. And they've computed gas con the gas compositions. In equilibrium with a mixture of 10% carbonaceous chondrites of type C5, C5 and 90% H ordinary chondrites. These are high iron. They have lots of metallic iron in them. So there's much reducing power in this while the CVs bring in more of the uh, volatiles. The gases are all, gas compositions are equilibrium and all produced at one bar. 
the dashed are the dish are the mixed cases and the solid is equilibrium. I don't know the difference. I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. Um, what you get depends on the quench temperature. At 1300 Kelvin, you'll get carbon monoxide. At uh, the, the thing keeps dinging. Like God knows what what is so important. Uh, what is quenching? Quenching is you take a parcel of gases, you reduce it to its elements and at very high temperatures, and they react to make small molecules that are happy at high temperature. As the temperature of the gas parcel drops, those molecules react with each other to make molecules that are happier at lower temperature. But as the temperature continues to drop, those reactions between the molecules become slower and slower, and then they just stop. The parcel can continue to cool, but the chemistry in the parcel is fixed by what it was when those reactions stop. If that stopping, if they stop at 1300 Kelvin, you have carbon monoxide and H2 mostly. But if they stop at 700 Kelvin, you get methane. This is good. So to, to get methane, you need a low quench temperature. How do you get a low quench temperature? You have a very large event that takes a very long time to evolve. Long time means the reactions can continue to lower temperature, or you can add a catalyst that lowers the effective temperature of the reactions, the effective temper quench temperature. Impacts can also reduce Earth's pre-existing atmospheres. Um, Casting looked at um, exogenous reducing source as a continuing flux of small meteors, and he found that the atmosphere switched from CO2 to carbon monoxide. Genda and colleagues considered reducing power of individual big impacts, beginning with things that aren't hugely big, but by Benner et al. in 2010, the focus was on the single biggest event in the um, late veneer. Zanli et al. considered a range of impacts, and we can look at that stuff elsewhere, composition of gases, photochemical evolution of the gases after they were formed. Uh, the atmosphere, the resolution of the paradox then is that the atmosphere of early Earth was transiently reduced. This will work. Highly reduced bodies strike the Earth after the moon forming impact, and they turn the water into hydrogen, carbon dioxide into methane, and nitrogen into ammonia. And this point was made by Yuri in 1952, who imagined that the impact ejecta would be full of things like iron rain, which would react with the uh, the oceans and the atmosphere. That's my, um, let's do that in slow motion. Slow motion, instant replay. There's the impact with its impact shock. The atmosphere is made very, very hot and a whole bunch of high temperature tolerant molecules get made and then it cools and cool stuff like ammonia and methane emerge in the cooled atmosphere. The late veneer. You heard about this last week from Markey. Highly siderophile elements stranded in Earth's mantle suggest that Earth accreted half a percent of its mass, half a percent of its iron late. The ruthenium isotopes in those hydros, amongst those highly siderophile elements imply that much of this material was dry. They, the ruthenium isotopes are akin to those in dry reduced impactors and not in carbonate, not of carbonaceous chondrites or comets. Does the late veneer actually matter if it doesn't bring water? Indeed, yes, it's even better this way because the veneer delivers reducing power to the surface. There is enough iron to reduce one to three oceans of water to H2. And if the late veneer was dry, the water was already present. So you have the oceans there to react with. The iron reacts with the oceans and CO2 to make hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane. The big impacts are the best because they evaporate the oceans. This gives you high pressures, hundreds of bars globally, and high pressure favors ammonia and high pressure favors methane. The surface temperatures are high initially. The cooling is slow because it's limited at the runaway greenhouse limit. It can also, the atmosphere can only radiate as fast as it can condense water. It takes thousands of years to cool to 800K, and it takes another couple thousand years to cool to 300K. The long time and high pressure favors methane and ammonia. Now catalysts can help because nickel is not easily oxidized. It won't be oxidized in this event. So the metallic iron delivered by, metallic nickel delivered by the impact may still be present and available to act as a catalyst 
I have not, it has not been computed, but it's a thought. But just gas phase reactions alone will make methane. There's an example of that, quenching after a vesticized impact. Uh, time scales on the top running up to 2000 years, temperatures on the bottom running from 1400 down to the critical point of water, 650 Kelvin. At high temperatures, you get small molecules. And notice that ammonia is actually quite tolerant of high temperatures. That's not ammonia's main problem. Ammonia is pretty thermochemically stable. As the parcel cools and ages, you hit the ammonia quench point first at about 1100 Kelvin, and then the ammonia levels are fixed by the solid line. Had there been catalyst, it would continue to follow the dotted line and the equilibrium concentration. Methane first appears at a lower temperature, but builds up rapidly as temperature drops. In this particular example, the quench points at around 750 Kelvin, and then the methane is fixed. If there were catalysts, it would, the methane abundance would continue to follow the dotted line and would eventually replace all the CO2 with methane. Oh, specifically, this is a case with two bars of CO2 before the impact. This is a free parameter. We don't know how much CO2 is in the atmosphere when these impacts occurred. We do know that there was water and I put about 1.85 oceans in to begin with. You'll see why. An example of a vestivized sized body. Uh, the number of impacts in the late veneer is on the top and the size of the impact on the bottom. This is a compendium now of all outputs for the two bar CO2 atmosphere. If the impact is small, you don't get methane or ammonia. You do get some CO but mo and a lot of hydrogen, but the carbon dioxide for the most part survives. The hydrogen comes from the water, of course, that we have, that we have evaporated. 10 to the 22 grams, this is an impact that's comparable to the South Pole Aitken Basin on the moon or the Hellas Basin on Mars. There's no question impacts of this size occurred. Earth should have seen something like 100 of them. As, the, as we dial up the size of the impact, we start getting into the range where there's enough energy to evaporate the oceans. Vesta is indicated by the blue bar here. As the impacts get bigger, we switch from CO2 to methane and we start building up our ammonia. So carbon monoxide actually goes downhill along with CO2 as the, as the atmosphere moves into more methane rich territory. The biggest possible HSE, uh, highly siderophile element Late veneer impact is around two times 10 to the tw 25 grams. This is a Pluto sized object. These very large impacts produce atmospheres that look rather like Neptunes uh, with lots of hydrogen and, um, and methane, but there are very few of them. There's only like one to three of them in this range. So only a half a dozen impacts are gonna be large enough to give you a methane ammonia atmosphere. Um, oh yes, active catalyst will shift all the curves to the left and that gives you many more opportunities to do things on early earth. So if there were active catalysts, there'll be more than many more events than three or five that will give you methane because each of the, all these curves will shift to the left because the quench temperature is lower. After we've got one of these atmospheres, we have photochemical evolution occurring to them. Methane photolysis will make organic hazes and tars. We see this on Titan. It will also make with the dinitrogen on ultraviolet, you'll get nitriles, also seen on Titan observationally. Um, the model will take the CO2 and water and use them to oxidize the methane. Uh, hydrogen escapes, organic tars fall to the ground and precipitate, they rain out. I treat the oceans as an infinite source of water, which is a reasonably good thing to do. And the UV optical depths are all scaled from fractal haze models from Walter Toon. Uh, in this case, we have an initial condition of 100 bars. We're gonna consider the largest impact that we could consider, a Pluto-sized event, the biggest event in the uh, late veneer. We'll call it the full Benner. The atmosphere is held to be dry. The period of time in this event, because we started with a lot of CO2, we ended up making a lot of methane, like almost 15, 20 bars of it. The methane lasts for about 35 million years before it's fully destroyed by photochemistry. In the course of being destroyed, it leaves behind a haze and organics and nitriles. 
the haze has an optical depth of about five. So that's similar to what you get after a very large fire. And then you have to walk around outside up the street with a flashlight. Um, hydrogen escapes throughout this event. Once the methane is gone, the hydrogen escape begins, finishes off the remaining hydrogen and you switch over to a more oxidized atmosphere with carbon monoxide, water, and CO2. Don't mind this axis, which refers to the dashed curves. This is for people that are interested in photochemical modeling. The final result in this model is 1.7 kilometers of water escaped and 300 to 500 meters of organics precipitated. So this review of this event, you get a rock vapor atmosphere, water become, uh, dissolves from this mantle into the atmosphere as steam, hydrogen builds up, carbon monoxide is rich, methane builds up rapidly over this magma ocean phase. Then there's a quick transition from the magma, note the funny time scales on this axis. Uh, the methane undergoes photolysis to make organic hazes. Methane jumps, by the way, as the temperature drops at the end of the runaway greenhouse phase. Then photochemistry occurs, methane is converted into organics, CO eventually, things will reoxidize through hydrogen escape and um, with using water to make CO2. And then the CO2 is imagined to subduct and get impact ice ages. This is the same story that I showed for the moon forming, after the moon forming impact. So a recap on the big late veneer impacts. Ocean vaporizing impacts by insulate chondrite-like bodies, reduced impactors are effective in making methane ammonia from CO2 and water because the pressure is high and the cooling time is long. Ocean vaporizing impacts leave Earth with a reduced atmosphere fit to evolve, but on the other hand, ocean vaporizing impacts may annihilate any previous progress towards life. So there's a reason to think you only get one shot at this in, on an Earth-like planet. Weather, everybody asks about the weather, Hidean weather, hot or cold. Last week, you learned that the sun was faint. So that's me why it might be cold. A cold, faint sun might give you a cold weather. Why might it be hot? It might start hot with the moon, the moon forming impact. Can it stay hot? Depends on the greenhouse gases. The CO2 that was exhaled by the moon forming impact, you start hot, but then it has to go away. So your leading contenders of greenhouse gases are CO2, which is your no hypothesis. Um, how much, how quickly you can remove it depends on how rapidly you can pull calcium and magnesium and iron out of the crust. And this can take time. It takes, it might take several um, generations of ocean crusts to pull out, to make enough cations, to make enough carb, uh, calcium carbonate to remove it. Methane is a potential greenhouse gas. If there's a lot of it, H2 is better. H2 has um, some nice properties as a greenhouse gas if the pressure is high. Um, some non-classical contenders, uh, carbonyl sulfide has been talked about. I don't think it's very plausible. Ethane is likely to become quite popular again because you can make it from ethane, from methane. And ethane is a much better greenhouse gas than, than methane. And it's also quite robust like methane. It, it's not going to quickly go away. So it's, it's a good potential alternative greenhouse gas. Uh, immediately after the impact, the moon forming impact, or after a very large impact that creates a lot of CO2, the earth will evolve along a constant CO2 path to look colder and colder temperatures as its heat flow dwindles. So after the runaway greenhouse phase ends, the heat flow drops off. And as it drops off, the Earth's trajectory along this plot is to cooler, colder and colder temperatures, but CO2 is still in the atmosphere until you hit the faint sun Earth at about 500 K. And it's kind of an artist's conception of what uh, a hot Hadean might look like. Um, at 500 K, you still have a liquid water ocean. You'll have volcanoes, you'll have continents, maybe. You'll have an ocean, you'll certainly have hurricanes. And I put in island arc volcanoes because I want subduction to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere so that we can get a cold Earth. As the CO2 is removed, the trajectory of Earth then goes from the high CO2 down to a low CO2. And the albedo will sort of, will increase a little bit as, it, as the CO2 leaves until 
the surface becomes cold enough to make ice. And when ice hits, the albedo gets very high and the temperature gets very low and something like 230 to 250 Kelvin might be expected once the CO2 is gone. And if you don't have alternative greenhouse gases available to keep things warm. Under these conditions, you'll have a cold, a cold Hadean with its ice albedo stable. The, the, the ice will not be so thick as Europa. You will have volcanoes. Here's an active one. You, will, you may have dry land if there are any continents because it's not gonna precipitate much. It's not gonna be any much snow or rain and certainly no rain. There'll be moats around the volcanoes. There'll be cracks and leads in the ice because the ice won't be very thick generally. It might only be hundred meters thick over much of earth because the heat flow is still high, particularly over spreading centers. And there'll be well, melt ponds on the surface because the sun is still pretty bright compared to like Europa. And you can have melt ponds. And I put them at the equator here. And the melt ponds can concentrate organics and might be a, a useful place to look for an alternative scenario for the origin of life, which is concentration of organic materials in freezing melts. To wrap it up, um, a more traditional picture of the late veneer of the Hidean running as a linear from left to right. Uh, the water is the water of Earth. In this picture, I'm imagining Earth having more water before the moon forming impact than it had later because each impact by dry bodies is going to leave the Earth drier because hydrogen escapes after each event. The uh, HSE delivering impact, the big impact of the late veneer is marked here. I put them in order. They probably don't have to be. The, this impact could be the last one. This impact could be earlier, but there'll be several of these, but, these, but this one could be the last one. There's still a 10% chance that it was as late as 4 billion years. Uh, the height of the poles indicates whether they evaporated the oceans. The South Pole Aitken Basin is not big enough. And so I don't have the pole sticking out. Each impact has a tail of methane that it produces if the impact is reasonably reduced. I don't think a comet impact would give you a methane tail or is like near, it's not as likely to because it doesn't bring much reducing power with it. And that's it for this talk. We've run, up, we've run out of time, I'm sure. Many colleagues have been involved in this work and a partial list is here. As always, colleagues are blameless unless they choose to be blamed. If you're interested in reading more about the astrobiological history of early Earth and astrobiology in general, may we recommend the new University of Arizona book, Planetary Astrobiology, edited by Vicki Meadows, Dave DeMarais, Giada Arney, and Brittany Schmidt. And specifically, read chapter one, The Creation of a Habitable Planet by Rick and me. You'll love it. If the book is not yet available or is yet unavailable, and you'll note double negative because as a scientist, we like to use them. It is possible to ask an author for a preprint. So think about that if you wanna read more. Thank you for your time. Oh, damn it. How do I stop this thing?